No, but we have a quorum. We, quorum. we have two people on the phone. At, uh, I, I haven't oh, heard them, so. We've got six people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're recording now. Who's on the phone? Let me guess, Lynn. Why don't we start the meeting, okay? <laughs> oh, I would just make like, no it over You will find out as soon as we start the meeting. All right, this is Spence is killing us. You got, roll, you got a roll call? Okay, I think you want to open the meeting? Huh? You got to open the meeting. Let's check. Okay, let's call it all. We'll open the meeting for uh, Monday, April 11th, and uh, Planning and Zoning Commission. And uh, do I have a, got a roll call? Can we have a quorum present? And yep. we also have Heather, uh, Commissioner Forget, and Commissioner Hickson on the phone. Okay. There you go. All right. Yeah, we have. Well, that's okay. Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, so Corso is absent. Pledge of Allegiance. And to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Excellent. All right. Item one approval of the planning and zoning meeting minutes dated March 28, 2022. Any questions? No. Motion to approve. I make a motion to approve. Second. I'll second. A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any days? All right. Um, well, and commissioners, can I just ask for you to speak into your mic? May I please ask for you to speak into your microphone? Oh, I'm sorry. You speak? That's okay. Um, just because uh, we do have. People Does that sound that, better? Yes, we do have people that want to uh, hear and listen to a recording afterwards. Thank you. Can everybody hear now? All right. Let's pull it down a little bit if you want to. Speak. No one's going to have a reason to speak anyway. <laughs> oh, well, could be speaking this one. So item number two. Stacy, you taking over there? Okay. Um, thank you. I'll just do a very brief introduction. Um, tonight, as you see, item number two, we're going to be listening to a presentation discussion um, from our consultant, Kim Lee Horn. We have Rebecca Field who's come uh, from Tucson to uh, make our presentation as to the status of where we're at with the <clears throat> sign and circulation plan. Um, basically, that is uh, involves two technical memos. One is A and one is B. One talks about some existing conditions and some research, and the other uh, kind of provides an analysis and some initial, um, uh, you know, design thoughts. And so with that, um, this is for informational purposes, but we really hope to, um, you know, kind of pull out some interesting, you know, uh, observations that you may have, questions you may have. Um, let her go through her presentation and then let's have a uh, robust conversation. So with that said, um, we've got Rebecca to, to present. All right, well, thank you. Hopefully I'm talking into the microphone, okay? Put the microphone a little bit closer to you. Okay, let's just put it right there. How's that? Does that work? Okay, yeah. perfect. So again, thank you all for having me here this, uh, this evening. Um, excited to walk you through our process. I know Tom has heard a bit of this before, um, but really wanna make sure that everyone is fully up to speed on all that has transpired with this plan. Um, we have several things to cover this evening and uh, I'll, I'll move quickly over some areas and then we can dig into certain other areas uh, in the interest of time. But we'll start with Tech Memo A. As Stacy mentioned, this was really looking at existing conditions. We're gonna look at circulation observations, existing parking conditions and inventory of the existing signage that is in town center. And then also a summary of the stakeholder input that we've received thus far. Um, based on that information, we have we developed a Carefree Town Center draft concept that we'll be reviewing with you all this evening. And then we also have our technical memo B, which is a summary of wayfinding strategies based on the results of Tech Memo A, and then a map of the existing and proposed wayfinding sign locations that we'll review. And then lastly, we'll take a look at the wayfinding sign draft concepts for your uh, review and comment as well. So moving into Tech Memo A, um, we, we wanted to look at the existing conditions within Town Center to fully inform the process as we started looking at a wayfinding plan. Wayfinding is based on how people circulate through the town. So that's with the vehicle, that's either by foot or bicycle as well. So we wanted to make sure that all modes of transportation were uh, looked at before really getting into the design of the wayfinding strategies. So starting off with roadway, 
um, you can see this map on your screens. Um, there's uh, several roundabouts. We're calling them roundabouts. They're really not roundabouts. They're like traffic circles. They're, they're challenging. And I, we'll have lots of conversations about this moving forward. But we've identified on this map the locations of the roundabout. There's one stop controlled intersection um, at Cave Creek and Tom Darlington. And then there are multiple right turn lanes, which um, we'll discuss later in this this discussion as well on the implications of all of those right turn lanes with some of the improvements that we're, we're talking about. But these are your existing roadway facilities. Some of the observations that were made um, during our initial site assessments, and these happened in late summer of last year, and then we also attended the Thunderbird Art Festival in um, the fall. Um, the internal town streets radiate out from Easy Street, as you know, and it's unclear which route is the most direct. So that's a common complaint that we've heard. Um, there are a lot of intersections and driveways along the arterials, which um, anytime you have intersections and driveways along an arterial, it's a point where there's a potential vehicular conflict. So um, there's a lot of those potential conflict points along this um, section of road. It's also difficult to locate the direct entrances to town core along the arterials and at Bloody Basin simply because there are so many different intersecting streets. There is signage, but the signage is hard to see, and we'll get into that later as well. But it is difficult to locate which is the best route to get into town center. And then the traffic circles really do um, present uh, some challenges. They create confusion for the driver. They detract from the gateway features that were um, somewhat recently installed. And then the operations um, that we've seen happen at those intersections are oftentimes unsafe. People aren't sure how to navigate them. And this is both um, at the main entrances where your gateways are and then the internal uh, traffic circles as well within town center. And then the gateways themselves um, have limited visibility. And we'll talk about that uh, as well as we, we progress. But from a vehicular circulation standpoint, these were our main um, observations. Um, we also went into a bit of detail with the, the arterial roadways. So that's uh, Tom Darlington and Cape Creek. Um, we will be looking at those arterial designs in a lot more detail. That's not something that we'll go into in, in a lot of depth tonight, but we are looking at opportunities along those streets. So um, we did look at those roadway profiles a bit more carefully, looking at the lanes, the um, reduction of, of laneage that occurs near the traffic circles, and then again, those many right turn lanes, which do create some challenges if we start looking at on-street parking along those streets. Bike lanes are present throughout the corridor, though, so th those were noted. Um, and again, we have our four-way stop controlled intersection at Tom Darlington and Cave Creek. So just a couple of images, um, which I'm sure you're all aware of these conditions, but these were just some of the, the items that we noted. We have the existing signalized um, pedestrian crossing as well that has uh, some challenges from a visibility standpoint. You don't know that the signal is working um, when you're waiting to cross. So that um, has a, a potential to be a, a conflict and it's something that could be looked at further. The right turn lanes do um, impact the potential for on-street parking in some of these locations. And again, they do create some of the, the challenges um, with the vehicular movements and pedest potential pedestrians along that corridor. And then the traffic circles are certainly an item that, that from a stakeholder perspective, from a, just an internal review perspective, um, those are, are challenging intersections. From the pedestrian side, uh, we looked at the existing sidewalks and existing pedestrian crossings as well. This is a map showing the existing sidewalks. And you can see we have some areas with some great coverage and then some other areas where there is very poor coverage of a, from a pedestrian standpoint. This is, is uh, very clear in looking at this map and that there's uh, a lot of gaps and a lot of reasons why you see people walking in the street. And as we come up to the observations, it's again, limited sidewalks. There are some areas that have good pedestrian conditions, but there's a significant lack of sidewalks along uh, much of, of the town center. We recognize based on the earlier assessments that were done as part of the, the master plan that is, it is a complex issue because of limited rights of way in certain cases, but it is something that as we progress forward, we'll need to look at that and how to get pedestrian access in these um, areas. 
There's also not a designated pedestrian entrance to town center, which we've heard um, from discussions with the stakeholder groups and others that that creates some confusion as well. And of course, there's no way for pedestrians to really get to town center from outside of town center because there aren't sidewalks along the arterials. Um, this the noted lack of shade or amenity landscaping is certainly not within the gardens. That's beautiful and that's a perfect example of how landscaping and sidewalks should work. But in some of the other areas, there is a lack of amenity landscaping, which means people aren't going to want to walk on on any of the the areas because it's hot and there's really not amenities for them to to use um, as they're walking through those areas. Here's some good examples of. The sidewalks here within town center these are all great examples of nice wide sidewalks appropriate landscaping shade seating amenities and then we have our examples that are not so great that are areas that can be approved upon so we have sometimes vehicles that are blocking an area where a pedestrian could walk um, there's a uh, people walking in the road as you can see there by the spanish village and again just a, a significant lack of connectivity in the sidewalk network. From a bicycle standpoint, as I, mean, as I mentioned before, we do have bike lanes along the arterials, but that's it. So um, there isn't any uh, measure for bikes to, to really go into town center. They could ride in the roads, of course, but this is a, an area that we do see um, a significant room for improvement where we can increase uh, bicycling into town center itself and expand this network out. Also riding in bike lanes is not really comfortable for certain people. So it's, uh, it depends on your comfort level on the road, but uh, they, there is a limited opportunity, as I mentioned, for, for all types of bike users to access town center. So going into existing parking, this was another um, aspect of your existing conditions that our team analyzed. We do have parking planners um, within Kimberly Horn. So we did take a look at this um, pretty heavily. So um, we looked at the parking supply, the percent of parking spaces by type of space. And you can see um, overwhelmingly 69% of the spaces are private. We have 31% public. Um, so they, the spaces that are private are really meant for that particular business and that can limit overall accessibility for parking in town center. This is a distribution of the public versus private parking. You can see um, heavily uh, private on the south parts of town. There's a few um, public lots there, but uh, clearly the majority of the spaces are privately held. So we started then looking at parking thresholds and from a parking perspective, there are three categories of um, occupancy levels. And from a, again, from a parking planner perspective, it's under capacity if the lot is under 70% occupancy, optimum capacity is 70 to 85%, and then effective capacity is anything over 85% occupancy. So where we're hoping to see parking lots is in the optimum capacity range. We don't want it to be under capacity because then it's wasted space and wasted investment. Um, and then of course, if it's over capacity at the effective capacity level, if people have a hard time finding spaces. So this is the distribution of parking within those capacity levels in a non-event condition. So the orange color is the effective capacity, which again, that's the, the heavily used areas. The yellow is under optimum capacity and then the green is under capacity. So uh, many of the lots, non-event conditions are under capacity and there is you know, significant opportunity for those lots to be higher, high, more highly used. Of course, they are private. So we need to look at that balance and see what kind of partnership could be, could be made to, to, to look at that further. But there are spaces available is, is kind of the, the root of the, the issue here. Um, again, looking at typical conditions, um, the percentage of spaces in high, medium, and low demand areas, 97% of the private parking is under capacity with only 3% at effective capacity. By contrast, the public spaces, we have 52% at effective capacity 
36% at optimum levels, and then 12% under capacity. So we do have a couple notes there on the side um, where construction of new parking, uh, even lots is expensive. It can be 5,000 to 8,000 per space for a, a surface lot. And we see opportunities given your distribution to utilize or optimize the available spaces to better serve the overall parking demand for town center. There are a lot of discussions that need to happen with that from a private public perspective, but it's from a, a observation, we see that there's a lot of surface parking that could be better utilized here. Now event conditions a little bit different. So do wanna go into that as well. Um, this is a map showing the event condition parking. We have um, in the orange color, high demand parking, and then in the green, the low demand parking. Those public lots heavily utilize fully fully parked, um, the, the private lots in the southern areas or towards the outskirts um, from the, the core town center area are lower uh, in demand. And then looking again at that same chart, um, private, we have 83% of the lots under capacity, 17% are at effective capacity. And I will say that a lot of the people that are probably parking in those private lots shouldn't be parking there. Um, there are signs that say you shouldn't park, but there are more people parking in there that, that should be that, than there should be. Um, from a public side, 96% is at effective capacity. So pretty much all of your public lots are fully booked, as we all know during events. Um, there's a definite contrast between high and low demand parking, and there's the an inability to park in the private areas, which is really creating that um, that significant shift from the previous graph. So um, again, a recommendation, but when possible, consider utilizing available spaces during events. And then we've also talked about parking on the streets, on Tom Darlington and Cave Creek. That's part of what we're looking at moving forward as uh, how to better maximize those roadway conditions, both from a pedestrian standpoint, a bicycle standpoint, and the vehicular standpoint by providing some parking along those arterials and helping to alleviate this issue during events. Um, moving, moving beyond the circulation, um, we went into sign inventory as well. We took a look at what existing signage there was through town center and then made some observations. This is a map showing um, the existing signs. Uh, there's uh, a scattering of directional signage. There's some obvious gateway signage that we have. Um, the destination signage, that's a destination sign is where it marks your location. So for example, the um, splash pad has a sign associated with that. That would be a destination sign. The gardens have the boulders with uh, their na the name of the gardens on there. So those are destination signs. The informational signs are your kiosks that you have that have different business information or different um, guidance on how to get to certain areas. So that's what the, the yellow dots indicate. But this is your existing network. And you can see there are some areas where there are gaps. Um, where we don't have any signage for people coming in, for example, on Cave Creek as they're heading north um, until they're pretty much at the, the town center or even past a way to get into town center. So there's um, locations here where it could be better utilized. And then we will look at the design of the existing signs and you'll see that some of them are not as effective as they could be. So starting with the gateway signs, this is an example of, of your gateway signs. We have the beautiful arches um, the sundial is even considered a gateway sign just because it is a iconic feature. And then the small carefree icon with the sun is, is another, I'll call it a, an icon sign, gateway sign. Um, the arches were recommended by the 2015 study and they are beautiful, but the biggest um, critique that we have of those signs is that their placement is ineffective. And the reason for that is they are parallel to the arterial. And so when you're driving down the road, they are in your periphery and they're not something that you see easily as you're approaching that intersection, especially because of the traffic circles that you're also having to navigate. Hopefully you're paying attention to the traffic circle and you're not looking off to the side. Um, and that's just because of the way the traffic conditions are. So those signs are um, something that we would not recommend to move, but we feel that they can be utilized in a different way. And we'll talk about that later. 
but uh, they they don't serve that gateway effect that was intended, we believe, with the placement of those signs. Looking at the destination signs, again, this is an example of the ones that, that are um, throughout town center. We have a lot of different styles, different looks and, and overall appearances of some of these. And within a wayfinding network, um, one of the things that is very important is consistency. So your existing destination signs do vary significantly and um, we would recommend a consistent, consistent branding. Um, for them. That doesn't mean that they all need to go, but there's a way to look at those signs and see what can be done to better tie them all together. So same story really with the directional signs. Um, there are a lot of different directional signs and the uh, sundial signs that are along the arterial tend to blend into the background, so they don't necessarily um, provide that strong directional guidance that you would hope to see from an arterial. So again, they vary significantly. Um, there are a lot of temporary signs that are added, the sandwich boards. We heard about that quite a bit from our stakeholder groups that they um, can add to clutter within the area. Many of the signs do blend with the surroundings. They have a really nice rust color, but that rust color really does look like it's part of the landscape. And then consistency, again, is critical within a wayfinding program. Lastly, the informational signs. These are some pictures of what you have out there. Um, because of the nature of those signs, there's a lot of information on them. They're difficult to read from a distance. You really do have to get right, right up um, on them. They also blend with the surroundings. If you look at their background or the frame, it's again that kind of rust brown color. It doesn't stand out as a place for someone to go get information. And then because of the nature of the needing to change out the information in there, they do appear somewhat temporary. So moving on to stakeholder input, what we received. We did send out a survey to our stakeholder group and we did get some great information. We've had several meetings with the, the stakeholders throughout this whole process to update and kind of give, give bits and pieces of this information as, as we've gone along. So we asked about parking um, issues with current signage, and you can see some of the comments there, similar to what we noted as well, too diverse, poor recognition, lack of legibility, the locations needed work, um, there's a question about where people typically park and the vast majority are parking on site um, next to the destination. From a customer standpoint, um, the challenges that we heard is it's hard to find businesses. There's no clear route around town center, the lack of sidewalks, handicap parking, um, and not enough parking. And then from a customer visitor standpoint, 60% of them park on the street. Um, main points of this one, um, points of confusion, we'll, we'll look at that. The, these are the main points of confusion that we heard about. The gateways are one, public restrooms, mostly where to find them, um, roundabouts or traffic circles or whatever we want to call them, but they are, um, I think they're more appropriately called traffic circles. Spanish Village was a, a area of concern, the corner of Ho and Hum and Easy Street. Um, overall downtown was a comment that we received, the bashes, and then the stagecoach village as well. It, it was a, just a comment that came in from the stakeholder groups. Um, so top two reasons to implement wayfinding. Um, the, the main reason there, confusing to find other destinations once they park. That's what we heard from our stakeholder team. So here's some other just quick thoughts when we asked for open feedback, parking issues. Um, there was a request for maps of public parking, the need for additional capacity um, for growth. And then of course, event parking was, was a big item. Circulation wise, um, unclear direction throughout town. The business signage clutter makes it hard to find businesses, the confusing traffic circles. Um, we, we just put in all the comments. There was a, a comment that said none there aren't any issues, carefree is not a standard place. So there are different opinions on, 
you know, what should and shouldn't be done with the wayfinding. Um, there's a suggestion to consider enhancements at the entrances to improve um, direction. And then a few other thoughts, and I'll, I'll really point to a couple here because we've heard about them uh, several times at our stakeholder meetings. Misters or shade along pedestrian areas was a, was a big item. It's something that is uh, obviously here in Arizona, it gets hot. If we're encouraging people to park even a little bit further from their destination, they need a way to get to their destination without burning in the heat. So shade, mister, something like that. Um, the one part that I think is really fun on this is the incorporation of a treasure hunt with public art pieces where we put desert features. They could be art and we'll, we'll show an example of this um, place near walkways that people can walk through and find. That's a really fun wayfinding opportunity. And you'll see that incorporated here in just a bit. So that's a quick, somewhat quick, Sorry, uh, rundown of um, the Tech Memo A. Uh, is it okay to pause for questions? Yeah, that might be good. Yeah. yeah. So before we move in further, are there any comments or thoughts on some of the existing conditions that we've described? Well, not really, because I think we kind of discussed most of this already once. Yes. Uh, the survey was kind of interesting. There was a few points that's not in the printer report. I, don't, I agree with all of them. <laughs> yeah. There's a little bit of confusion out there. Sure. We heard a lot about other things that I didn't mention in there, but the post office parking is a is a hot topic um, for residents specifically. So we are aware of that, and we're aware of the, of the challenges of the postal service here, um, and that everyone needs to go to that post office. And find a vacant lot where you can get to the post office to move to get you. <laughs> We're not, uh, <laughs> that would be a great thing, I'm but not, I'm not saying <laughs> that. How is um, the hotel going to interact with parking? Because I know that they have some parking that's on the grounds, per se. Yes. And obviously, that's probably not sufficient for oh, yeah. if they had it filled. When we went to, when Matthew went to P in planning and zoning, I think they've got more than adequate parking on site. Okay. The exciting part will be with that is when people leave in the morning, the they're leaving at the traffic circle going into the post office. But fortunately, they pretty well have to be out of, be out of there by nine o'clock, and most people don't start going to the post office till 10, 10, 30, because the mail hasn't come in yet anyway. So but it'll be interesting to watch the parade of, of them leaving from that park a lot. <laughs> right, right. I know that we were just talking about parking there, and they are over their required number of parking. Yeah. Because they, you have parking for guests, but then you have parking for you know, yourself, basically. At the facility itself, they, they pretty much have the parking spaces. Yeah, well, it was, that already. Um, well, Chairman, uh, 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 members of the commission, um, they do meet the required number of parking. Um, they have, I would say, um, two thirds of the parking is on site in the parking lot that you see developed sort of to the west. Um, they do. What's interesting about their property boundaries is that. While they look like they're on street parking as if they're off of easy street, they're actually on their property. Um, and then the, the remainder of the balance is shared uh, parking with the existing towns parking that is on easy street. Um, they have been, um, they did agree to allow us to use some of their private spots that look like they're public. Um, so, you know, we have a good kind of working agreement with them that Obviously, their their spots, and you're right, um, Commissioner Davy. Um, they do have, uh, and I don't know where they're going to ask their um, their staff to park, but overall, they've met the parking requirements from um, based on zoning. Um, uh, Heather or Lynn, do you have any comments or questions? <laughs> yes, I do. Thank you very much, and thank you for the presentation, Ms. Field. Um, how's my audio? I think you're good. Everybody can hear you. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. And I will encourage my um, commissioner friends in the room, if you could lean into the microphone, that would be um, very helpful. We'd be grateful. Um, one question that I have, or just mostly maybe a comment for future consideration is, um, how do we factor in the new forms of transportation mobility into our thinking for example, drop off and pick up points for ride share, Uber, et cetera. 
plugins for new vehicles and all the different ways that I can't even imagine people will be um you know visiting and coming into the town over the coming years so i would just encourage us to put that into scope any comments on that rebecca Sure. Um, I appreciate you mentioning that. That is something that we're, we're hearing. Um, my firm is, is particularly focused on the transportation industry side. So we do um, look at tr those trends pretty carefully. And there has been a lot of discussion on how there may be a lesser demand for surface parking in the future, given what, what you've just mentioned, the ride share the different modes of transportation that people are using to get to destinations and that um, the the push to build surface lots and more and more and more parking is really an antiquated way of thinking of things because there is um, a, a much higher percentage of the population now that are using um, a shared method to get to to different destinations so that would also factor into the overall parking consideration within a network. I think um, what we saw most importantly was the event condition parking and how it was mm. down the streets and you know it was completely 180 from what you would normally see on any given day um, here. And so it's a balance between how to effectively park for that event but not create a empty sea of vacant parking spots for 95% of the rest of the time. And so that's something that as we get further into the discussion of the design and we'll, we'll look specifically at number of lots that we'll need to take into account. For sure, and I think I heard you say at the end there that in terms of design, that means thinking about access for ride share coming in and out. It, 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 it would incorporate drop off and pick up points that are easy, act, easily accessible, et cetera. Is that what you're thinking? That's correct. And, and actually, the next piece that we're going to go into is the Carefree Town Center draft concept, where we do talk about, uh, or in the plan, we show um, better ways for bicyclists to enter into the community. So that would be a different mode of transportation, obviously, but really encouraging residents if they're able to jump on a bike have it free, feel safe um, be off street to, for the most part to encourage people to to use that mode of transportation versus getting in their vehicle and driving so we're looking at that we're looking at um just ways to to help lessen the reliance on the vehicle make it better for pedestrians better for bicyclists and better for other um, alternate transit modes as well. Got it. And I, my second question, if I may, Stacy, may I continue on? It'll be about signage. Um, I think, uh, C Commissioner Ferry, you wanted to add something to the parking conversation. Oh. Just one moment, Heather. Uh, Commissioner Burgett. Oh, yeah. I'll get close to the mic. Okay. Uh, basically, this bicycle thing, uh, I think we don't want to overplay it. We don't have really that many bicycles, people coming into town with their bicycles to go shopping or do anything. Uh, I don't think we should overfocus on bicycles. I mean, we're an older town, very few people use their bicycles to come into town because they don't feel safe. And even if whatever we do, it's still not gonna make it safe enough for people, old people on bikes to come running around town. That's just my gut feeling. Yeah. And, well, and if I make comment on that, because I like that we're having a discussion here, this is really good. Um, and thank you, thanks for helping to <laughs> facilitate no it worries. across the yep. platform here. But I hear that point, and of course you're right, but I'm wondering about in the coming years when the generations today are now 10 and 20 years down the road becoming residents, becoming more active in town, um, that those behaviors and mindsets may be totally different. So I, I just would encourage us, even though we might not have a lot of bike riders today, we've got our bike shop now, and who knows, in 10 to 20 years, we've, we've got a new cohort that will have different behaviors. Well, also, um, I was under the impression that Savannah had um, people coming into town uh, with bikes that they have at Savannah. Oh, there you go. Good point. Yep. 
Um, well, I think um, all good thoughts to, um, you know, kind of bring into the mix. Um, and so, Heather, you had a, a Commissioner Brigade, you had another question? Yes, if I may, on signage. Um, and this is procedural, so Stacey, it's over, over to you, please. Um, what is the process? I understand there's probably, I mean, I imagine there's probably been some healthy debates over options on signage and what we're looking at and where we might go in terms of design and effectiveness. And, um, who, what's the process for um, the final design decisions and what is the Planning and Zoning Commission's role in that? And how does it work? If you could describe that, I'd appreciate it. Um, sure, uh, uh, Chairman Cross, Commissioner Burgett. Um, I mean, you are going to be involved in making those recommendations uh, ultimately to town council. And in fact, we're gonna be looking at those in, in just a few minutes. It's kind of our next sort of step in um, uh, Rebecca's presentation. And so uh, again, hopefully we have kind of a, a good and um, you know, kind of a, a back and forth, a good dialogue about the designs that we see. Um, you'll see that they're, uh, you know, and being um, obviously as the staff side of this, stakeholder group has already kind of looked at a preliminary, um, some preliminary options of um, different types of designs. And again, I'll, I'll let Rebecca explain them in more detail, but in essence, um, I think we're here and we're uh, presenting to you tonight to get that feedback and to then ultimately bring that uh, recommendation from you as a group to town council. Um, I think that as we do bring that to them, once we get closer to finalizing the plan, or maybe we'll even think about doing an update to them just like this tonight, um, just to talk about everybody's feedback. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know if everybody's going to agree. Um, that's sort of how process works. And hopefully um, we can uh, see, and maybe there's certain elements of one sign that we'd like to see incorporated into another sort of uh, concept or brought into, you know, there's a, mer a merging of different uh, ideas between signage, but um, it, we're here tonight to kind of go through, um, go through these options and get your feedback um, today. Okay, great, got okay. it, thank sure. you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I have one more comment on uh, ride sharing, like Uber and Lyft. It seems to me uh, when I have seen that, rather than parking somewhere, they generally, just like cabs used to do, um, wait on the street right in front of whatever establishment they're called to. Hmm. Right. I mean, I, I have seen a number of, uh, you know, ride sharing things in, in Carefree at night, like with restaurants. And uh, they generally are just out on the street waiting for the people to come out. And the people usually come out pretty promptly. Yeah, we've we've definitely seen that as well, and that's that is towards the kind of the direction, the push of maybe not needing as many surface parking spots in the future because of of that change in behavior. And then yeah, I, I don't think that you know, like having specific parking spaces for that is is really something that's that's going to be a big priority because they usually are just waiting in front of the establishment. Um, and maybe it's something where, since the trend might be having or not needing as much parking, maybe where that parking is becomes these drop-offs or, or, or points of, um, you know, I know it's going to be in front of every establishment, but, you know, there might be kind of a hub of where we find where more people are going at certain times of the day or evening, in my opinion. Right, but as far as um, evenings, if they're being called to restaurants, a lot of times, People want to do the ride sharing thing because they've been drinking and, um, you know, they, they don't want to be driving after they've been drinking, but they also don't want to have to walk to a collection point. They want it right out front so they can just kind of stagger out to the vehicle. <laughs> we, we understand. <laughs> Okay, so um, should we continue on with the signage? Yeah. We're good, okay. Great, well, thank you. Thanks for the comments. So moving moving down into the agenda, um, we'll, we'll get into the Carefree Town Center draft concept. And uh, just before I share that, the reason that we, are, we provided a, a draft concept is that this began again as a wayfinding project and specifically looking at the signs. 
But when we looked at the existing network, as we've just discussed, there's a lot of gaps in circulation. And there's a lot of areas that could be approved upon. And if we're looking at wayfinding and how to direct people into appropriate areas, we want to be sure that we're taking that full circulation into account and that we're planning for the future in, in ideal conditions. And so this is uh, why we, we looked to create this concept that you'll see on your screen. It is um, small, hopefully you're able to, to see it well enough. I do have a, another slide with a zoom in area, but um, I'll walk quickly through the overall. So just to orient you, north is up in this. We have um, Cave Creek there to the east. Tom Darlington there on the west, uh, Bloody Basin on the south end. Um, we've identified a pedestrian gateway feature, again, from the comments that we heard from our stakeholder groups. Um, and, and just in the survey results, there was a desire for a pedestrian gateway or a pedestrian designated pedestrian entrance into town center. So that's um, number one on the screen. Um, number two, those are the vehicular gateway features. So you'll see that those are um, there on either side of the, the existing locations where the gateways are. The large gateways, um, what we're seeing those uh, as really having a significant potential for is to become that pedestrian gateway feature. Because as a pedestrian, when you're walking through, you can really appreciate and see that uh, gateway versus from a vehicle where you're really trying to just navigate through um, the roadway conditions there. So where we sh we're showing number two is the vehicular gateway features. There are four of those locations. And those are where, um, again, as people are coming into town center from either the north or the south, those would be where we would through signage and through other um, methods, hopefully get people off the arterials in that location, get them into town center, and then really reserve that central piece of each of those um, arterial core areas as a, a more of a pedestrian focus. And you'll see in this view, I'm gonna flip to the next screen because it's a zoom in view for it, for you can see. We'll back up if we need to, to look at some of the others. But you can start to also see some thoughts that we have on the arterial designs themselves. So you can see in the what with the white striping, some changes that are being recommended um, that we're, we're still vetting, of course, but we're looking at adding some parking to the arterial streets uh, along Tom Darlington and Cave Creek, either um, via angled parking or parallel parking. Um, the black line with the white dash marks in it, those are uh, new multi-use paths. So a multi-use path is for bicycles or for pedestrians or for strollers or for uh, non-motorized scooters or something like that. Any, any other method of travel other than a motorized vehicle or a motorized bicycle. Um, those would be areas off street that would enable you to get to the locations. And it's, so it's not just for bikes, it's for pedestrians too. Um, we also have, uh, so those are, you can see where we have the number twos um, on this. And then again, there's one just off this screen further, further south of Wampum Way. But that is where we would have our de designated vehicular gateway features. Um, item three are uh, those are decorative paving enhanced landscape areas. So um, we have some opportunities to really play up the existing surfacing on the, the intersections that are shown with the uh, icon number three, um, and then enhance the landscaping specifically in those interior traffic circles. The um, landscape area is so small that you have people taking left turns and not really going around the whole traffic circle. It's so wide that they're able to just turn left. And so we would want to increase that area and really make it a feature. Um, so that's what we mean by enhanced landscape and then adding a decorative pavement element to those as well, or enhancing what currently exists. Um, item four, those are uh, just the overall, the street enhancements. You can see that there on the left side of the screen on Tom Darlington, and that's what I was referring to just a moment ago about enhancements to the way the road configuration is. It's leaving the pavement width alone, but it's looking at striping out some parking, narrowing it down to one lane in both in two directions um, so that we're slowing traffic down and, and having people really realize that this is more of a pedestrian core or a bicycle area or just a, a <coughs> more active space 
that you shouldn't be speeding through um, at, the, at the pace that people are going through there now. Um, you'll also notice some striping kind of in the area of the roundabout itself. It's a widening out that circle um, where the number ones are so that we're helping to guide people around that traffic circle in more of a roundabout fashion. But we would recommend even studying those further and seeing if a if they could truly become roundabouts in the future. This is more of an interim condition where we're just striping to help increase the safety <coughs> in those locations. So going into town center a little bit more, looking at number five, um, what uh, we think is a really strong opportunity is for a designated town center pedestrian route. That's shown in the kind of the brown color um, as it winds through the gardens. You'll see um, some other areas with the number five noted where those are really nice wide pedestrian walking spaces. And those would be signed uh, with uh, consistent signage to show that this is the way if you choose to walk through town center, this will get you to all the different places you want to go. And that was a comment that we heard from the stakeholder group as well that that was one of the main concerns. People just weren't sure where to go when they when they exited their car and started walking around. Um, looking at number six, this is uh, one of two potential contentious items that I'll bring up. Um, number six is the potential closure of uh, that small section of road um, to through traffic. And it would be um, it would be able to be accessed by by emergency vehicles. So there would be uh, bollards that would be placed there, but it would be closed to through traffic. And what that does is it uh, connects the west side of the gardens with the pavilion area and it makes that a pedestrian free, like a, a pedestrian space that you can go back and forth and not have to worry about cars um, crossing in that location. We think that's a really feasible option in this area because it's, you know, there's plenty of other ways to access the parking around there. And it's just a small stretch of road that by closing it, it really can do a lot of benefit by linking those two pieces together. Um, item seven is the one that had a bit of discussion during our stakeholder meetings. And this is purely a, a suggestion um, or a, an opportunity that we can talk about. And it's utilizing those two areas noted as number seven as potential event areas in the future recognizing that those are private lots and recognizing that there is uh, significant conversations that would need to happen um, to turn those into more of event areas. But again, when we look at the town from an outside perspective, it's a, the center of town, there's a lot of potential there. And those are currently privately held lots that during events, they're very, um, you know, it's a space that really is underutilized. So one without one. <laughs> just a, a comment and an opportunity that we see. <laughs> so um, moving on to eight, can I think I, I'm- Can I ask a question? Sure, of course. Um, vehicular gateway features are number two. Yes, right? correct. Okay, so I'm just wondering, with number six closing off number six, I'm just wondering how the flow, no, southbound on Tom Darlington accesses the post office. What would you recommend? We still have one away. Well, yeah, but you get into it and then how do you get out? All that parking right now is angled. So you'd have to do a K turn to get back out. You know, you have to do that on Fridays when they do the the market. Where number six is where you're closing that down. Or it does one way. You don't, it eliminates a circular flow past the post office from the north. Um, so you're saying southbound on Tom Darling? Southbound on Tom Darling. Sure. How do you get into the post office? And then if you're parking the way that you have number seven set up, you're coming, you're going northbound there, right? So you'd angle in on the right. And then to get out, I don't, I mean, then you're really going through a maze to either go through the hotel parking lot or go through past the sundial. I, I'm not sure you've clarified flow there so much. Just 
a comment. Sure, sure. No, I appreciate that. I think that number six is you normally would come down Ho Road, go Hum Ho Ho Hum Road through number six, park at seven, and then exit past out on Wampum Way. You see what I'm saying? Yes. That's a flow. Sure. Sure. And the way that you have this, you would anyway. Put it down. Understood. Thank you for that comment. Uh, you know, one one thing that I will mention is that um, where we're designating, for example, number two as as a vehicular gateway, there would still be vehicular access um, where, like at Lucky Lane, for example. So you could come in in that location. It would you'd have to wind up. You're you're right. And then um, you'd need the sidewalk if you wanted to park there. You'd need a sidewalk or a path to cross the gardens there to get to the post office, which wouldn't be all bad, sure. but you don't have one. Sure, sure. And there isn't one now. You have to go to the first way to get around it. Sure. Mm -hmm. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, we will we will look at that under we'll take that under consideration, just access from that direction to the post office. Anything? Uh yes. Um if I recall, the Hampton Inn and the condos were going to put in some uh, sidewalks, weren't they? Um, yeah, Chairman uh, Commissioner uh, Hitchin, correct. Um, and I think those are shown on this plan. If you look uh, at Easy Street uh, between the, uh, the View Carefree and the Hampton Inn, just to the north of it, those dark gray uh, areas, those lines are new sidewalks, and you're right. Um, Right, I, I just mm -hmm. wanted to point that out yeah. that, mm -hmm. you know, that, that is a, a big help with the town not having to do that because sidewalks are expensive. Yes, agreed. Yes, so we're, you know, fortunately development coming in is sort of helping us uh, build in that infrastructure, I agree. Right. I, I just wanted to call attention to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see, I will, I'm going to back up one, um, just to look at the overall per picture again, um, for item eight, those are carefree town center welcome features. Um, you can see there at the, the three, um, edges of town, uh, that would be, a, a way to inform the public that you are coming into the town center area. So it would be through a signage feature of some type. But um, at those at those three intersections labeled as number eight, we feel that that is the the marker that you are entering somewhere special, and that um, that should be a visual cue to start slowing down and recognize that there will be more pedestrian activity and just more on street activity as you continue on through the core. And then lastly, uh, item nine on this list um, are potential redevelopment areas, and uh, I'll go. Let's see, you can you can see one um, about the, in the gray there at the top areas and there's we we didn't actually label it we should have there at the, the very top. Um, let me see. You can kind of see it in this view. It's at the very top of the screen where it's suggesting um, some additional parking um, within what is currently an existing alleyway. Um, and then we also see some other opportunities for surface lots or, or other just development areas as well, as shown in item nine throughout. Excellent idea. Can't have to soon enough. <laughs> Any comments on this plan? No, I think uh, it's been well thought out. You, know, you can kind of argue over that little session of uh, six, but. You can still get in and out the same way going back out by the sundial. Uh, the fun part you'll have will be on the, the east side of the post office, putting that the designated pedestrian route in there with a between the parking and a water water ditch there, and then a transformer to boot. So because I've walked out before, <laughs> well, I do my morning walks, but uh, that's a, that'd be a superb idea for there. Yes. No, I think it's been well thought out. It's what we got. Deal with it. The sidewalks, the additional sidewalks will between the townhomes if they ever get it done, and the uh, hotel, and then the townhome. All, all townhomes also put uh, a sidewalk on the uh, north side of Elbow Bend too. 
and that'll make a complete sidewalk all the way around there, which again is good. That's assuming they ever get done in our lifespan. Um, any commissioners on the phone have any comments or questions? Okay. Any commissioners on the phone have any comments or questions? I don't. No. Um, hi, it's uh, Heather. I will just ask regarding the um, recommendation to turn that section of Hope Home into pedestrian. Are there any implications to that? I mean, do we need to get more stakeholder engagement on that? I mean, that seems like the most significant change here, unless I'm thinking. Um, uh, Chairman Commissioner Brigette, I mean, yes. Um, you know, we try to encourage the public to join in these meetings, you know, every time we, we hold them. So, um, know. you know, I think that um, once you all agree as a group that, you know, and I don't know if you actually have to uh, all unanimously agree or not. I mean, we'll definitely bring all comments forward. But, um, and I think that uh, Rebecca's doing a good job at kind of highlighting. I think we'll do the same as we bring it through the process of highlighting sort of, you know, yes, these items that, um, you know, do need more public input and hopefully we will get that. Um, well put, I totally get it, Stacey, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, uh, I think uh, Steve Prokopek has a couple comments. I'll be I'll be quick um, just to, to kind of get to that and to Commissioner Burns comment um, that that is an issue that we, I understand and we've been talking with the, the private property owner who's wants to look at the circulation all over that parking lot because right now it's just, it's a one way for the post office parking out in front of the post on, office on the south side not on, on the west side yeah so on the south side and so that's driven by because there's a mailbox yeah um, but I, I understand what you're saying. So when people pull in, they have to go all the way back out in front of the carefree consignment and go to the sundial to get back out towards Tom Darlington. Um, so we can look at the, I think that's one of the things when we look at this plan is how that would flow an angled parking versus uh, straight in. Straight in, yeah. And if there's enough room for the, the access in between, you know, so the drive aisle is wide enough. The other thing I wanted to point out just real quick is, is when you look at the vacant lot that is shown as number nine um that's next to the town hall right. it's just beside where the if you look at the village center master plan which we've gone through that is shown in the village center master plan as parking so the deviation here from what was originally shown in the village center master plan is to look at parking where rebecca showed over behind the shell station that's that that would be additional parking there and then also the parking that would be on the arterials itself so i just wanted to kind of point that out as you start comparing and contrasting between the, the documents couple so uh, mr chairman rebecca um just looking at this going northbound from the bottom of the page on tom garlington you're adding new sidewalks and they stand out but there are sidewalks down below that um in front of the bashes Shopping is that is that the same path concept that you're thinking about? Would those have to be redeveloped, or are those sufficient to blend into the ambiance of the of what you're existing or trying to do with all these paths? Sure. Um, so, really, what we're looking for is connectivity, and right. as long as there is a sidewalk in the area that is accessible. Um, that you know is obviously in good condition, it could remain in place. You know, what we're looking to do is provide uh, the connectivity in those areas where there are gaps and to make sure that there is a way and a fully accessible way to get from, from point A to point B throughout the town. Mm -hmm. So where we do have sidewalks, um, you know, we would certainly not recommend tearing them out or doing something different to, to make it completely cohesive with the new sidewalks. And really the sidewalks that we're recommending are just are pretty much standard sidewalks, um, but just adding additional landscaping and signage and things like that to them. Okay, and then um, going northbound again on Tom Darlington where you hit the two by Carefree Drive, just north of that, are those street, is that street parking right there, those angled lines? That's correct. Um, just talk to me about the evolution there you go. Well, it's kind of cut off there at the bottom, yeah. but yeah. Talk to me about the evolution of thinking about 
angled street parking on a major arterial because I remember the day when Indian School, Thomas, Camelback Road all had angle in street parking and now it's all gone. So we've, we've had quite a bit of discussion on that. Um, we do have uh, traffic engineers on our team and roadway engineers as well that have been looking at this from a safety standpoint. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that the, the traffic would need to be slowed down so that the point of the narrowing of adding the traffic calming measures is to get traffic moving slower through this piece. Well, so, if people are backing out of angles and parking onto a main arterial, you're going to slow down traffic one way or the other. That's good. And you're going to, going to right, exactly. You're going, to, you're going to plug up the lanes there. So you better have traffic detours around for traffic accidents and, and whatnot. But it, are people doing that now? They are. So there's um, examples. Old Town Scottsdale has it. Old Town Scottsdale, we were just talking about Glendale Avenue has it as well. Um, there are uh, uh, several ways to do that. You could look at, you know, parking, just angle in. You could do back in parking as well. That has um, improved safety because you're, maybe for a driver, it takes a little more skill, but when you're exiting, you can see because you're pulling straight out instead of um, having to back into traffic. Well, there's one lane like that and where it is, yeah, you can't have perpendicular parking. It's gotta be angled parking. Um, we're showing actually a mix of that. So there are some cases where we do think we could we could have the parallel parking. It's there on the, so for example, on Tom Darlington, it's on the west side of the road in certain locations. Yeah. Um, the areas where we do have angle of parking and you can see in this this highlighted view, it's pockets of angle parking and then and stretches without because there are the right turn lanes. And there's other things that are hindering their ability to go in. Is that really just designed for events. I mean, the, right there where you have the, that's the Chase Bank. And I don't, I mean, other than an event, I don't recall that yeah, parking problem. And then you're going to put in five or six spaces on Tom Darlington there. I'm just, whoever is, who is ever going to use it? I, I, I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I'm just saying you're not going to park on the street to walk into the, I would not think most people would park on the street to go into the bank. Because the bank has its own parking lot. More parking lot. Is on anyway. yeah. My point. So like with all the online banking. Now you're creating a traffic hazard, right? I mean, to me, you're creating a traffic. Already you got people flipping out by your own words, going through the traffic circle. They're missing the arch. They want to see the arch. Then they're in the traffic circle. And then some guy pulls out backing up. I, I just, that little area. I, and then I, so, and then I guess back to one of your earlier points is how many days a year are those going to be vacant? I, I understand the, you know, the event parking problem, but my guess is that other than the, when the Thunderbird art, festival yeah. is here there ain't gonna be six people that park there i mean i just I think, yeah I, I know i know that a lot of the merchants and the restaurants um are unhappy with thunderbird because their clients can't park right in front of their stores and, and their clients just don't come if they can't park in front of their stores yeah, I understand that, but we're going to be creating those parking spaces that are going to they calm traffic, but they're also going to be vacant 300 days a year, 330 days a year. Right, people and, basically and, want door and day parking. And are you encouraging then people, strangers coming into town, oh, there's a parking spot, I'll take the parking spot because I must be close to something. But but you're really not close where you want to feed the, the pedest, pedestrian traffic. I'm just asking. Sure. Um, so I I can speak to some of that, and if Stacy or Steve, if you want to add on, um, one thing that we are trying to do is encourage pedestrian traffic in that area. So that is why there is that multi-use path that we're showing um, on that side where the angled parking is, in hopes that you know if. But to your point, it is predominantly for events. Um, 
currently people are parking off the side of the road. It's creating a traffic condition and a hazard as it is. On event days. On event days, correct, yeah. correct. And so this is to plan for those event times in a way that could also be utilized as a pedestrian core during non-event times. And if um, someone parked in one of those locations, either event or non-event, there would be a way for them to walk into their destination of choice within town center using the new multi-use path and then using the new sidewalks as well. So what we're looking to do is create a more accessible experience um, that you don't have to park in town center if you choose not to, or especially during an event, there is an, a safer way to park rather than pulling off the side of the road um, and just parking freely wherever you'd like. That's that's why there was the original intent to put parking here on the side of the streets. But to your point, you know, it, it obviously if you have the choice to park in front of your destination, you're going to park there. Right. Just... Well, if we're looking at pulling people in from every place north of the 101, um, you could be getting a younger demographic. The demographic and carefree, according to a, a recent uh, demographics check, is that most people in carefree, the majority of carefree people are over 50 and a lot of them are over 65, so they don't want to do a lot of walking. But if you are trying to pull people from north of the 101, it's probably good to have that extra parking. Can I ask you a clarifying question? Um, online here are we speaking of the section of tom darlington and and parking along that is that where we are right now yes ma'am i will contribute to that thought go ahead stacy what was oh, that yeah well, i was going to clarify that for you yes i mean we are talking about that but i think we're also having a conversation somewhat uh, more generally speaking about having this additional parking on on the edge of town center i think peter's kind of you know, we've kind of noted a, a specific area kind of as we know town center today. Um, my, my feeling about it, um, my two cents, and, and this is, um, you know, you know, open for debate as well, is that, you know, we're looking at, you know, a, 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 a more developed, maybe a more kind of um, exciting have a, a town center. This is kind of how we kind of are forecasting that you can see a lot of those gray pieces are redevelopment. Um, so we might think of, well, why would anybody park down south right there? But there could be some new and exciting things that are happening in that part of town. Um, and I do agree with what Rebecca is saying. You know, you might have somebody that's just coming in. They're going to park and they they want to kind of make their way and, and tour around the town center. But as I've always sort of understand it so far through the process, it's not that we had a parking uh, count problem. It was more a proximity uh, issue. And I think what we're trying to do is in my opinion, I don't think we're necessarily just designing for the event. I think we're kind of designing for kind of um, districts around town center where where things might be at some you know at some um, one time or another. And um, regardless of your opinion of the hotel, I mean it's going to be bringing more people. It's going to be bringing new and different businesses. I think that are going to be sort of um, spread out throughout. I think the town center. So. Um, maybe certain locations might not, you know, we can rethink sort of some of the spaces, but I think it's the concept in general about adding this parking with, again, not going to something like a, a parking deck and things that, that are a little bit more costly. Um, I just wanted to add one thing um, based back to what Commissioner Burgett also has said about um, the controversy of closing Hoham uh, in the area that it's shown. And it just kind of came to me, and it's something that we can talk about as we go through the process, but we can always do uh, demonstration projects like this as well. I mean, we can look to close this off and see how the public reacts. And if we are getting positive or negative, you know, it doesn't have to be something that's, um, we've all, you know, ultimately decided to close Ho-Hum and, and, and we're, we're permanently stuck, so to speak, with that. So um, those are just my quick comments. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And then I'll take that ball, if I may, regarding the parking along Arlington. Is that then, are we saying that it would narrow the roadway and the through traffic? Yes. That is correct. Yes, it would. I, and, and I, I must say that I did not see that that was what was scoped on this map. Um, I was, maybe I misunderstood the drawing, but 
I was pleased to see that didn't seem to be in the cards because I do think like we've been discussing, there could be significant issues on backing up traffic along Tom Darlington. How do we really get to the bottom of this um, significant, really important question? So part of our scope of work is to create a project assessment and that project assessment looks at those two arterials and looks specifically at the implications of this type of design. So it looks at the traffic impacts that may be caused. It looks at the, the issue of vehicles backing out. Um, it looks at the uh, traffic volumes through the area and what that's going to do to narrow down to one lane. So that is something that we are in the process of finalizing and that um, can be put for, for comment as well. Um, it is a technical document, so it is our, our engineering team that's looking at that um, with our traffic planners and traffic um, engineers uh, to assess the impacts of something like this on the roads. Mm. And when would that come to the planning and zoning? It's something that we have um, pretty much ready for internal review at this point. And so we could look at having it out to the, this commission shortly. Uh, okay. Heather, you know, Heather, we talked about process, Commissioner yeah. Burgett, I mean, and we have a stakeholder group, so it's sort of, you know, the, the consultant kind of pulls together the information and it gets sort of uh, assessed through our stakeholder group and then it kind of comes back to, to planning and zoning. So, um, you know, it's, it is coming back to you, but it, it kind of gets vetted through um, our, our group who are made up of residents. Uh, we do have um, a liaison commissioner uh, as well as council member. And then um, it's a good diverse group. We've got business owners, property owners, um, and again, um, interested residents. And we've had some interesting and diverse feedback because uh, just as you and, and even the commission right now kind of looking and thinking, you know, these things are, are, are dramatic changes. Um, but, you know, working with a consultant and trying to also solve the issues of safety and crosswalks and how do we get people really to um, slow down as they get to our town center, not only just for safety reasons, but also to then understand. And, and I think Rebecca will start to talk about this. It'll, it ties into how the directional signage will work. And then, you know, ultimately, you know, the goal of bringing people in the town center. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the fact that Carefree is interior is a real problem. Everybody tends to drive past it to go to Cape Creek because they don't even realize that the stuff is in there. I think, though, given the traffic that we have seen um, grow on Tom Darlington and Scottsdale Road leading to Tom Darlington, to narrow that roadway there, we should think good and hard about it. It sounds very, um, I, I'm concerned given the trends that I've seen in traffic flow. But thank you. I will save that to when we see a more detailed analysis. One follow-up question, if I may. Remind me, please, if you would, who is our representative from planning and zoning in that stakeholder group? I am. Okay, terrific. Thank you. And so is Chairman Cross. I was going to make one suggestion. Stacy alluded to an excellent, it's an excellent idea. Notwithstanding, you've got to take it out. I mean, it's one thing to draw it here. It's another thing to pull out the tape measure and where your right of way is and the width and everything else and the parking. But uh, one thing one could do in a, in a hurry just to see how it might, what kind of reaction you get without getting shot would be put out some uh, temporary barricades out there for about a week and a half to two weeks and just see what happens. But that I mean, that's with, that way you don't have to, nothing permanent. But I have mixed emotions one way or the other on that, the way traffic is, but uh, uh, it's certainly a thought, but yeah, this is not the final. We're just talking about things. And, uh, it might be time to carry on. But when you think about, when you think about making it one, you know, one one lane, there's a lot of sections along this road that are one lane already. Yeah. So hello, uh, and when you do that, trust me, people do slow down when you just got one lane. Yep. And, right. And that is something I think we're trying to do. To, people slow down as they're coming close to our town. Well, then maybe. They were the people that were on their way to Cape Creek, and all of a sudden I go, oh, wait a minute, what's this little town off to the side here? Maybe I'll try, just drive through and see what it's about. I mean, right now, people just come whizzing down that road, and even where I am over at Ridgeview Estates, and we got that, that uh, crosswalk sign going up, and people just buzzing through there because there's two lanes. Somebody will slow down in one lane and stop, 
but don't walk across because you're going to get hit because the other idiot in the other lane isn't paying any attention and he doesn't see that lights flash and he just zips right on through or she zips right on through so if you have only one lane that's going to slow people down and that again why do we want to help people get through our town fast i don't want them to get through town fast i want to take their sweet ass time getting through town that's a good point you know so i, I we already in my my hoa we've already backed the idea of where that uh, crosswalk is is to narrow it down to just one lane at the crosswalk and you got so many other areas where it's one lane and you got people supporting that uh having four lanes it just doesn't make any sense when you're trying to make this the entrance into our town in a sense i mean unfortunately you got to come down to tom darlington to get into carefree there's no way around it i mean unless you're coming down from cape creek road coming off of pima but most people are coming down over scottsdale road and then they come into tom darlington this is the only way you're going to get into town and to keep that as four lanes and have people just zipping through because they were in such a hurry to get to cape creek or whatever uh i, I just don't think it makes sense i just don't think it, and, and a lot of people in my track don't think it makes sense either they want one lane we'll probably get a chance to make a decision on that later point taken yeah. um but i will say and i think that and rebecca um mentioned it too is that they do have traffic engineers on board and i, and I think commissioner burgett's um comment is noted and maybe it's um, an understanding of actually where's the best location for that um, narrowing down to one lane happen yeah. so that it doesn't cause any you know problems with traffic in the future and we've already got some places that, uh, on both of our arterials that are down to one lane i just like to add this is this is also a comprehensive plan that's not going to happen tomorrow i mean yeah. we're talking about something that may take the next 20 years to accomplish and so, you know, and I understand there's there's things that we can deal with today and with challenges, but we're also, you know, to kind of Commissioner Burgett's um, comment earlier, I mean, this is about looking towards the future and future generations. And so that's really, I think, what we are trying to focus on here is it's not just trying to find stopgap measures to be able to fix today's problems, but let's avoid tomorrow's problems as best as possible. And I think looking at the traffic volumes obviously is going to be a component to that. When we went through the engineering study, with rick engineering when we looked at the, the pedestrian safety for the crosswalks they didn't see any need for the two lanes i think for like the next 30 plus years if ever um but i think obviously getting a second hand and looking at this from a different perspective when we get to a final design through kimley horn to help validate that it's, it's extremely important and when we they are completed they will be pro pro providing engineering based drawings for tom darlington and cave creek road because it's important to get to that yeah. level of detail um, and then um, also, and I think you guys have touched on it, Commissioner Farrow, uh, our biggest challenge from an economic development and revitalization piece is just people having a sense of arrival and recognition that they're someplace. And on-street parking helps with that significantly. Um, is these, are these the right locations? Well, that's, I think, I don't, maybe, maybe not. And maybe Tom Darlington doesn't have the on-street we look at Cave Creek. Um, but I think that looking at the concept and, and the con in that context is, is, is important. And it could be that we just agree that parking on those materials won't work. But it's something I think for us to explore and to try to put it in the right places if it makes sense. Um, I also want to add just one more thing. When we look at the pedestrian walkways, one of the things that's extremely important to a lot of residents are being able to access from across Tom Darlington to the adjacent neighborhoods and as well as Cape Creek Road. When you look at how we do our crosswalk all together, right now, because there's no lateral cross, no lateral ways to, to walk, um, people automatically just want to cross at the intersection that's closest to them. But we can actually look to consolidate the number of crosswalks across those streets by being able to provide good multi-pathways that go from, you know, maybe from Tranquil Trail and Bloody Basin all the way you know on the on the north side of cape creek road instead of having to cross at that intersection there and then we can consolidate where those pedestrian crossings are by having better lateral so just that's another thing to think about because i know that type of safety is something extremely important in connectivity yeah. just out of uh, interesting what's your or what is the vision for uh how people presumably coming up tom darlington that are going to stay at the Hampton Inn that have never been here. What's the traffic flow for them? That one's pretty easy. <laughs> well, you say that, but the Port of Cashier is not where one would expect it. I mean, I would think you'd go up and take Carefree Drive, but then 
the entrance is all the way on the north side. Sure, we drive to Easy Street and wrap around. The signs will be there. Well, maybe that's how we transition into the signage conversation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we probably ought to go that way. Just put a sign up, will you? Yeah. <laughs> we will. Yeah, we will. You'll go on to Tech Memo B. Um, again, I, I do appreciate all your comments. It's something that you know, we, we like to hear feedback. If we don't hear feedback, we really don't know the direction that we're headed. So, can I ask a question? This is a revised Tech B memo. Yes. Okay. Just, I used to do this with my employees. There's no way on the revised tech, the revised memo, that I understand that it's revised. You haven't changed the dates from the original. You haven't put revised on it. It is. March, it says March 12th, 2022. The one we looked at before was. It says March 8th on the revised, and it says March 8th on the original. The original Just, was presented in February. Um, yeah. So. And we got the second one? Could be that you just have we the, got the, the second one. Well, no, I think Commissioner, Bur Commissioner Burns, the date's on the inside. I mean, I think maybe the edit was made around the same time in March, but it, the inside of the document, if you look at the footer, shows that it's March 2020. I think the previous version was possibly January. 20th. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But then the first time we got it with the March 14th agenda it was already revised. That's correct. Oh. It was revised based on comments from um, our stakeholder meeting, which I believe was February 28th. So there was a, a discussion for the stakeholders and then we revised it in March. So We'll, we'll look into it further, but I make sure we'll make sure that you know which is which. We're talking sign design. Let's go ahead. We're, we're talking wayfinding strategies first. Um, so this is a summary of the wayfinding strategies. And I will say that between the original and the revised, there were very few changes. We didn't get a lot of comments. Okay. Um, so they are very similar. Um, starting with the uh, the pre and post trip strategies. There are several strategies to, to wayfinding and what these cover are what happens before someone comes to the community or what happens after they've already left the community. So um, the, the recommendations that we, we've offered is the development of a town center parking and destination map. This is something that we think will be very helpful. Um, it could be paired with your website. <coughs> it could be paired with a, a QR code on signage or even a mobile application platform where um, a map would come up. It would have the, the town uh, center on it. It would have the parking locations. It would have the various destinations and it would introduce the public to the, the layout of the town and help them plan their routes through town. So this is just a, a standard thing with, with any wayfinding program is that you want to have a map and an overall view of the overall network um, in the, the visitor's hands before they're even on site. So these um, maps could also be handed out by businesses and it could be further reinforced in town. Um, we've also uh, shown a picture here of the desert gardens map. Uh, our recommendation would be for that map to be revised so that it matches the look and feel of the new branding program. But uh, obviously some the map in itself, the gardens map is very helpful. And what we would recommend is something on a broader scale for uh, the town center as well. Um, we also had a discussion on the creation or purchase of a mobile application platform. This was something that we did get some comments on from the stakeholder group and that uh, some were concerned about, you know, downloading another app. We all have a lot of apps on our phone. Do, do people really want to do that? Or would it be better served to have a QR code or some kind of a website that you could easily click on um, that would link back to the town's website and have the information there? So either way, the, the intent is really to get in front of the visitor before they, they get to their destination. So once um, someone is in town, um, there are several strategies that have been identified, and these are called in-route strategies. 
We have digital information kiosks that are being recommended in place of the um, more temporary look and feel of the information signs that are currently existing. Gateways at the edges of town center, which we did highlight in the town center concept that we were just discussing. Um, also uh, updated directional signage. So again, looking at a consistent look and feel and putting directional signage in locations that make sense, that are highly visible and that help direct um, visitors to the areas that they're looking to go. An improved vehicular entrance. Uh, again, if we, we remember back to the map we were just discussing, that was the number two. And so we had four of those locations where all of the, the entrances would still be obviously accessible by a vehicle, but those would be the, the more uh, improved and dedicated vehicular areas. Similarly, a designated pedestrian entrance. Again, that was number one on our uh, on the map, but um, those would be paired with where the existing gateway arches are. We also look uh, are recommending a coordinated parking system. So this would uh, have similar signage throughout the parking areas. It would be paired back with the map that would show people where they can park, um, what the distances are from their parking area to various destinations uh, and um, various amenities. The signage, as mentioned there, parking facility signage, it would be consistent. It would show um, those, those elements of, of where you can park and what the distances are. And then lastly, we talked about that pedestrian, that dedicated pedestrian pathway through town center. Um, we are calling that a visual pathway as well because of the, the great idea that one of our stakeholders had in incorporating desert art or desert um, animals into that environment. So this is an example. It's a salamander, it's actually from a playground piece. Uh, so not a desert animal, but something similar um, could be done with a Gila monster or something like that placed along the, the, de the designated pedestrian route. So it could be a fun way to really um, get people interested in looking, looking around. And it could even be a changing feature and it could be with local artists. So those are a few in route strategies that we've been discussing. Um, here's, uh, again, we showed this previously, I showed this a, a little bit ago, but this is where your existing wayfinding signs are. And then this is uh, showing the disposition of those existing wayfinding signs. So um, clear in yellow are the ones that we are recommending to be either removed or relocated. The uh, sundial signs along the arterials, those are beautifully designed. We think that those would be better served perhaps along one of the um, multi-use pathways where they can be better seen by bicyclists and pedestrians. They, as I mentioned before, they do blend into the environment. So putting them in a, a place where there's lower speeds of traffic and that's through a pedestrian or bicyclist, they can see those better and be, uh, they can be able to read those a lot easier than in their current placement. This is the location of the proposed wayfinding signage that we are um, recommending. We do have gateway signage shown in orange, and um, I, I do want to clarify that gateway signage does not need to be a giant arch. Um, there are lots of different things that can be gateway signage. It can be icons. It can be uh, just a, a tall column that says carefree on it. So it doesn't have to be to the scale that we see in our current gateway signage. But those are to designate the welcome to town center areas and then the pedestrian and the vehicular um, entrances as well. We have destination signage shown in green. So those are at all our main destination points, um, public destination points throughout the town. Directional signage is in purple. And uh, keep in mind that this isn't all giant signs. They can be um, integrated with uh, some of the other signage as well so that it's not Contributing to sign clutter, it's it's trying to simplify, even though there do seem to be a lot, but there's different scales of um, directional signage, wh whether it be for vehicles or pedestrians. So that that's a distinction that we're not showing here, but some of the signage would be pedestrian oriented and some signage would be vehicular oriented. Yeah. And those would be different sizes and different types of signs. The digital information kiosks are shown in yellow. Um, this is an update from the original version that we showed the stakeholder group, and this is what's reflected in the revised version of the tech memo, and that there was a recommendation um, to move one of the digital information kiosks over to Spanish Village, so that's what we're showing in this yeah. map. 
Um, originally we had uh, four in the desert gardens area. So now we have three and then we've moved the one out into the Spanish village. I think that's well thought out, yeah. So that one, that one helps with uh, the navigation through what we know is a, a challenging part of town. Um, and then the blue diamonds are, or the, I'm sorry, the blue triangles are uh, pedestrian maps. So those would be associated with the parking areas. We mentioned the need for parking um, level signage and parking facility signage. Those would be uh, maps that are associated with where most people are parking that would help navigate to the closest destination and help people understand that if they park here, it's really only a 0.2 mile walk to this feature. And so it's really not that far. Before I move on from this one, are there any comments on this? It looks like you've walked a good, good share of it. Get some mileage put in. We have, yes, we have. I looked at it pretty closely, drove around this thing. And, yeah. But you know, we got a lot, of, a lot of people that are going to come up here. They might not have a specific place to go to begin with. So they just want some place where they can park their car and then start walking around the town and see what the town is all about. Yeah. So that's the thing. I mean, the natives that live here, yeah, we, we don't need signs to know where we have to go. And people that have been here 50 times or 100 times, maybe they do know where they want to go. So then they don't really need the sign. It's for the first time person coming up here and going, okay, what's this town all about? And then they get to see these signs to help them find out where they might want to go. Yeah. That's correct. Yes. You've walked some miles on this. We have, yeah. We spent quite a bit of time walking through here. We've had a lot of good input from um, the the town, from our stakeholder groups. Uh, so there's been a lot of conversation about this. So I I will move um, to the sign design concept because I think that's going to be of of interest certainly. I mean, that's to the artists. <laughs> We have uh, two concepts that we will share um, with you today. Um, this is the first. Um, I, I will say that we have Bertram um, Design on our team. So they're the ones that have designed these signs for us. They've done a lot of work here in your community. So they're very, very familiar with the standards and with the overall aesthetics. Um, so this is the first concept that was presented to us. Uh, the, the two um, large signs there on the left with the hummingbird. Those uh, could be within the traffic circle areas. Um, they are really intended to be uh, icon signs, um, but they also double as directional signs as well. Uh, we have some uh, directional signage that could go on the lamp posts. Um, we have a, a smaller information kiosk sign there, and then um, some parking signage as well. So this is one option. Um, this was one of the earliest options that were was presented to the stakeholder team. Uh, we did get some feedback on this in that uh, there was a, a, a lot of interest and a lot of appreciation for the design of the, the um, traffic circle signs, but that the interest of those was, or that design element was a little bit lost on the other three signs. So um, Bertram was asked to look at the design of, of the whole package a little bit further. And then to also consider incorporation of icons because there is a, a, a benefit of using pictures instead of words. People identify with that a lot better. And then also considering color coding. So um, the next version is the revised iteration of that. Um, it includes a digital display, which is something that we've been talking about. Um, and then it uh, has the same types of features, but again, it, it looks at the creating a little bit more of a dynamic sign feel to the rest of the signs that are shown here, and then incorporating colors and icons as well. Well, you don't want to go crazy with signs. I mean, I mean, we're not that big a town. So I don't want 50 million signs all around town that you can't see what the town's about. Or you see, oh, this is a town of signs. Correct. No, I, I, I mean, let people explore, you know I mean? Jeez. I mean, most of these people are not, not going to, you know, you, you'll bump into the gardens if you're walking around town. I don't need many, 10 signs to show me how to get to the gardens. Trust me, if you're here and you parked your car and you're walking around town, you will find the gardens. I mean, if you don't, then you've got a mental problem. I mean, and I don't want you hanging around my town that long. <laughs> Well, I think with remove my comment on this and the overall uh, with the removals that are deleted 
and then putting in the signs like this, that's a tremendous improvement. Then have some consistency at the same time. Any other questions? What's the hummingbird? Why a hummingbird? Why a hummingbird? Can't freeze. Hummingbird tail. That that is a consistent logo that um, is seen on on your signage today. I thought we had a sundial. No, no, no. I walked around and I saw right in front of town hall. There's there's a couple of, of different icons and the hummingbird is used on the garden. So if you look at the um, where the the water feature is, there's the hummingbird there. There's uh, the hummingbird appears most frequently in the garden. Are you thinking these are lit back back lit? There would be lighting associated with them, absolutely. Back lit from interior. Um, we haven't designed them that far yet. Um, and if you're going with a digital display, do they hold up in the temperature? Yes, here? they do. Yes. So you want to give us a five year warning, 10 year warning? <laughs> well, I'll say it won't be me, but it'll be the manufacturer. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Um, if I may, I'd like to um, ask a couple of questions and, and make a suggestion. Go ahead. Is my audio okay? Okay. Um, and by the way, thank you very much again. Um, this is a very effective presentation from Kimberly Horn. We really appreciate it. Um, the decisions that we're looking at here as it relates to signage are actually really important and the beginning of one of many, many, many decisions to come that will help ensure that the town center of Carefree is relevant for generations to come. And so when we think about this initial decision, I would like to recommend that we have someone who is designated as our creative director, our person who is responsible for ensuring that the look and the feel and the vibe and the tone of Carefree is well captured and then express each and every decision along the way as we think about our the redevelopment task in front of us. So when we talk here, for example, like what's with the hummingbird, these are really important questions. And I believe that it's really important to get someone on point, engaged and super skilled and talented at directing us along this pathway. I really hope that we don't, as a planning and zoning or a stakeholder group or a town council, start making individual discrete design decisions without an end vision in mind that we're working toward. But basically, we are the people that this committee is the one that makes the decisions and stuff. I mean, no. who, how are we going to find, well, recommendations to the council. It's the council that makes the final decision. Uh, yeah, but Chairman, um, Commissioner Farrow, I, I, I think what Heather Burgett is getting to is is probably just uh, an expert in, in design. And I, yeah. what I'd like to add is that that is what Kimley yeah. Horn is for us. And That's so, yeah. right. Yeah. So um, they have those experts on board. They're yeah. working with Bertram who uh, is does, you know, I think the town respects as a sign designer. Um, I'll let kind of Rebecca speak to that more, but but I I understand what you're getting at, but that's where these um, designs are coming from. Yes, it did receive input from from a stakeholder group, but but these were professional designs provided to us, and it is ultimately up to when I say us, you as the town, us as this group, um, to decide what you like or don't like. And I really that's, that's what I was going to say. I mean, it seems to me that the reason we're paying consultants. Is because they do have these kinds of people on their team. Well, and I do appreciate that. My my point is beyond signage. It's not just signage, but it's all of how carefree is expressed through each of these decisions. And it needs an overarching design eye and vision for what that look and feel and vibe and tone should be across all of the entire process, not just here. Good point. 
this is like this is going to be the the community the town's design, right? But that's not going to affect all the existing sign, all the existing private sign that sits around. No. Uh, you can protect yourself. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you're putting it on the small sign across uh, with the are you thinking of these fonts? This is the font for the Neo Helvetica and all the um, no, I'll, I'll say that this is a very early concept, and I think font type is extremely important, legibility, making sure that it is um, easily understood. Um, there's there's a, a lot of discussion about upper and lowercase text and different types of fonts that are associated with visibility off of roadways. Um, Bertram, this is their their livelihood they they do um you haven't heard them i think they did that seal back there actually um so they've done a lot of the signage here in in the community um and then we as as kimley horn um we have an internal team of graphic designers as well so our graphic designers are not doing this we've we've given this to bertram as a as a local um sign designer um, and so we've been working with them, given their history in the town, um, they, they, the feel that we have heard from our stakeholder conversations and, the, and uh, the town discussions has been, you know, that Carefree obviously has a, an elevated appeal, it's upscale, it's, you know, it's modern, um, it's fun, and so those are the overall words that we've been hearing um, and that's what led to this discussion i think uh to the the point that was made about an overall vision i think that is very important it's almost like you want to create a a town vision or a town <coughs> mo logo or motto or you know something like that we've, we've seen other communities do things like that through specific branding exercises and that could be um, something to consider as well and you know, Ms. Field, if I could jump in on that, if I may, I think that's an awesome idea. And it's really interesting to me. I hadn't realized how this particular design task, let's call it, was put into the hands of the of the sign designers. I think for you at Kimley Horn, I mean, given your expertise and the breadth of your um, vision and where you've helped communities go, it'd be awesome if you could lean in really hard and say, how do we really express what it means to be carefree? I mean, it's an awesome initial value proposition, but how do we really express that value proposition in a way that makes it relevant for generations to come? And knowing where you all are experts and the level of work that you deliver, I bet you could really make a statement with that. I, I appreciate that. Um, we have worked on branding um, for communities. We've worked in Sedona, we've worked in uh -huh. um, Springdale uh -huh. outside of Zion National Park, um, doing similar programs like uh -huh. this. Um, we have, I will say, we have leaned uh, heavily on Bertram. There were other concepts that were prepared that were not what we felt were in the appropriate um, vision for what we understand that this community um, is and what it has the potential to be in the future. And so we are keeping that in mind um, and making sure to communicate that. We do, as I mentioned, we do have a graphic design team that is evaluating these as well when they come in um, and uh, working with them if needed to enhance or, or talk through things. So for example, the font and the arrows are, are something that as we look at them, we, we will ask for improvements to that moving forward. Um, and, you know, just to make sure that we have that, it's a, it's a collaborative effort between the local group that is, has done a lot of the signage here, and then, as you mentioned, an organization like ours that has done a lot of these same types of projects nationwide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I expressed to Stacey and Steve when we had a meeting recently on, on these topics, since I wasn't able to attend the last workshop, is that I know that we've got a lot of stakeholder involvement which is of course imperative and a real blessing. But how do we engage other cohorts who will 
in the next generation be who our targets are. Yes, it needs to appeal to our current audiences and our current um, potential target audiences, but how do we make sure that what we're designing today is going to actually appeal to where we need to be 10 to 20 years from now? And I would encourage Kimberly Horn to help us think about how to do that really well so that these smaller decisions, which add up to a big end product, are really where we need to be down the road, not just today. Well, I think if I, if I may comment on this, first of all, I got a whole, we got a whole table up. It won't be around here 20 years from now anyway. Hey, speak for yourself. Yeah, and, but, he's younger than us. <laughs> but as, as I was being on the stakeholder committee, I can comment that the designs have already changed since then, which is why we have a new uh, B, B for this. And it's been, I will make also make the comment it's done much, much nicer. I, yeah, appreciate it. Any other comments? Actually, just a quick, quick comment on the on the signage. Um, There's a motion on the floor. He made a motion. <laughs> oh. <laughs> We're not done yet. I'm not done. <laughs> um, just when it comes to the signage, you know, for when we look at the logo and you look at the hummingbird, you look at that little orange stripey thing that's in there. That was done as part of what I believe is a branding process when, when the town created its logo. So I, I would kind of ask, you know, maybe we can re revisit some of the history on that as to how we came up with the hummingbird and how that came about. And maybe we've gone through a little bit of this exercise already. Um, the other side of it is, is when we look at signage, uh, you know, this kind of, this kind of comes down to the idea of, you know, and, and Commissioner Burns, he asked this last time, you know, how much is this for people coming in and how much is are things for people who live here? And obviously the signage is 95% going to be for the people who, are coming into town and so the, it comes down to the idea of how much is too much signage obviously and so uh, that's something that we need to be conscious of but it also comes down to do and i think um when i talked you know commissioner burgett I, one of the things that you triggered in in me is the idea that it needs to fit into the nature of the community we don't want to look like a shopping mall but we want to fo function in a way that we can be productive to help our businesses and get people around safely and get them to the places they want to get to so you know, I think we're in a, in a unique spot to look at it, you know, from that. And we don't want to be flashy, but we don't want to be tacky either. So no. um, I just wanted to bring that up. Real quick. Appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. Um, and, and if I may add to, um, you know, we, we do, we have, I think, a very strong um, design consultant team. And that's always the big question with design. I mean, design is subjective. And I think that, um, I think the, the consultant and the professionals consider that when they present us these designs. I think, for example, um, the fact that we have a sign that has digital display, I mean, those are things that I think are considering uh, not just now, but the future and its adaptation. So um, that's, you know, that's sort of the, that's the hardest thing about how do you make a design timeless, but at the same time, um, you know, relevant today as well as in the future. And, and hopefully these designs and, and you know, I, there's I, this has been a great consultant to work with. If you like something, you know, let them know you like it. If you don't like something, let them know that as well. And, you know, and that's how design is. It's somewhat of it's an evolution. So. Um, and Steve, I think it would be great to your point about seeing the previous brand work that has been expressed. That would be a great compass for us to follow. So. If you're able to share that, that'd be super helpful. We will. Yeah, well, I, I do think the, the, um, I do I think the combination of Kimberly Horn and Bertram is a, a really good combination because Bertram has the history and, and both are very good at graphics. Yeah, thank you. I will say the next time we come together, we can bring you back some of that history and kind of bring people up to date as to where we are. That'd be great. Thank you. Well, I'm not. Let, let's be sure that our presentation is complete. Okay. Well, next steps. <laughs> so we are we are done. Um, we are very close. Yes. Um, so again. In a, in a future time, I know that you that you have asked questions about your existing signage. 
Um, here's some examples. We have other photos, of course, um, that we can start looking at all the different uh, types of signs that you have throughout the community and why some of these decisions are being made with the new design, because, you know, there was a lot of investment made in years prior um, that we don't want to automatically dismiss either. So, for example, at the gateways that currently are there, there's hummingbirds on those as well. So we're looking to tie in where we can and then enhance and make better for the future. So that's where our, our design philosophy is coming from. We don't want to undo um, the, love, the years of work and investment that has gone into this community as well. Um, so in terms of next steps, um, a, our next step is to start refining those sign designs um, based on comments that we're getting uh, from, from you all, from the community, from business owners. Um, and then creating messaging for each and every one of those signs and making sure that it is placed in the appropriate location, that we're not creating conflicts with too many signs um, and making sure, you know, that's a big sign clutter, especially so, for example, at Zion National Park, people aren't here to see signs. They're here to see the beauty. They're here to see in, in Carefree. They're here to see the town. So we recognize that. Um, making sure that we are promoting the messaging appropriately for each sign and then really thinking about that placement in more detail. So that is our next step. That's going to be our tech memo C that um, we will be preparing and then we'll be coming back and discussing that with you all as well. C, total, there will be four. Tech memo D will be the last one. <laughs> Just to keep it interesting for you all. So um, that that is it, though. I appreciate your time today. Appreciate all the, the input. Um, we have nine minutes left, unless there's a motion. <laughs> okay. Vivian, before we do that, is there any announcements? Uh, no, no announcements at this time. Um, but I would like to just quickly add, though, um, I mean, a lot of this is new information. Design is always sort of, it takes time to kind of think it through. Um, we'd be happy to also present and maybe as a follow up um, have uh, additional information as to the evolution as to how we've gotten to at least um, some of the what the the current thinking for, for tech mobile be because that might be helpful as well. Uh, and we'll do that maybe the next time we we uh, meet um, as well as have a little bit of a mystery or background as to the to the branding and the uh, and the uh, hummingbird. So that's all. Mm -hmm. I just want to add, we're going to be doing, reaching out to businesses, property owners, and then I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on, you know, what you think kind of public feedback you'd like to get before you see something else next. Is there some level of engagement of open houses, reaching out to HOAs that you'd want to see us do ahead of time so you can get that feedback from the public? Well, last meeting, I asked for a timeline of what we're looking at, because I... I understand this is the signage of Wayfaring, but then there's going to be other, that, and I'd kind of like to get at least a glimpse of what their totality is before we say that this is the sign and these are where they go. And you know what I'm saying? I mean, I don't, is that fair? I think it's a fair question. You know, I, I think one of the things we need to do is based on the input we've received, right. kind of start looking at what that timing is going to be. I think the other component is, and that's why I asked the question, is it comes down to, you know, on the public engagement part, yeah. How much public engagement, what type of public engagement do we want to include in this? And well, what kind of public do you want to see ahead of time before we come back? You know, because we don't want to hit you like 1,700 times, even though I've done that already. <laughs> um, you don't seem to be deviating from that. Path. I know. But the idea at this point is, is this is a launch for, as, as really in the public foray for what we're presenting here. Um, and so it's, you know, we really want to take this to the, to the streets at some level. I mean, I've already started talking with businesses and property owners. And, and that's all good to collect that. But I think that personally, Mr. Chairman, I'd rather get a better feel for the gestalt of the whole thing. And, and, and how long is it going to take us to get there? Um, and maybe I don't have to see the final product before it goes out to the, to the public. But I think that it ought to be fairly intensive. I don't think it should be a surprise to anybody when it's on our final agenda, unless they decide they didn't want to participate. Well, our input is, is input suggestions, and that's why we're here tonight. Right. So it collected quite a bit of information from that standpoint. And then it will be the final designs, this type of thing, in a normal procurement procedure. 
But are you saying we should have what I'm saying is open for the public, even if we get 10 people in here, so, so to, to have their input about whatever we're coming up with it towards the end. What I'm saying is the timeline will be impacted about the timing of when we do the public engagement. Do you want public engagement ahead of, ahead of the next time we talk, or do you want public engagement? Maybe you want to see it a little bit further along. So that's, well, I guess I don't even know what the next chapter is. Okay. I, 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 now I'm on I'm on signage right now. Last week we were on the town plan. When are we going to see the revisions to the town plan, or what's the plan for getting the town, the city center? I I don't. I don't I, uh, right, uh, Chairman. I, I don't feel it. I don't. I don't. I don't have the rhythm. Going here. I think, Chairman. I think what. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong. I would think what Commissioner Burns is saying is we have a lot of efforts happening at right. the same time, and I think he's trying to understand how these all kind of fit together and. And, and and because we're at about 1200 steps now versus you know right. you think 1700 yeah. but i think he's trying I, to get us what i don't around. want to do is be confronted with a final wayfaring plan way before i get some idea of what the ch further chapters are I, I think that maybe um economic development planning we, we got to come together we'll put we'll kind of try to figure out all the efforts that are going on right now and kind of i think have I think a, a progression as to how these steps are coming together. Well, yeah. so and that's the nice thing about having one consultant <laughs> managing a lot of these things. So we'll, we'll yeah, that's right. what's nice about having staff. You can order them around. Yeah. <laughs> Get your act together. Anything else? Uh, anybody else I, on the phone have anything? I'd like to thank Rebecca and you and Steve <laughs> for all the work that you have already put in. Well, this, thank you. This is this is the fun stuff for us. So, thank you. Anything else? Well, we got a motion to vote. Uh, I'm making adjourn. a motion to adjourn. <laughs> I second it. All second. those in, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, the second thing, Steve. Now that we're adjourned, what is the 